The Hamilton Naturalist Club is situated upon lands that people have lived among for thousands upon thousands of years. It is the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, the Huron-Wendat, and the Neutral Peoples. Today it is home to the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, the Six Nations of the Grand River, and to many other Indigenous people from across Turtle Island. We acknowledge that this land is covered by the dish with one spoon wampum belt covenant. This treaty between the Anishinaabe, Mississaugas, and the Haudenosaunee binds them to share the territory and protect the land. Subsequent Indigenous nations and peoples, settlers, and all newcomers have been invited into this treaty in the spirit of peace, friendship, and respect. We all share the responsibility of ensuring the dish is never empty, meaning we must take care of the land and the creatures we share it with. We are guided by the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada's final report, recognizing the urgent importance of the Commission's 94 calls to action in guiding the healing and reconciliation process. We seek a new relationship with the original peoples of this land, one based in honor and deep respect. May we be guided by love and right action as we transform our personal and institutional relationships with our Indigenous friends and neighbors. Welcome everybody to the Monday, January 16th Bird Study Group presentation. My name is Jackson Hudecki and I am the Bird Study Group Director for the Hamilton Naturalist Club and I'm excited to have you all here tonight. Our first meeting of the new year. I'm broadcasting to you live from Northwestern Hamilton, Ontario and we've got people from all over the place joining us here tonight. Uh, let us know in the chat where you're tuning in from. We've got 48 participants in climbing thus far. Um, so we're keen to have you here. And if this is your first time joining us, welcome. We've been virtual for several years now. Our program runs from 7.30 until 9 um, on a Monday night in the month, every month, um, from September until about April or May. Typically start with me giving up some announcements who then have anywhere from 30 minutes to an hour to present and tonight we have two special guests which I'll get to shortly and at any time tonight feel free to add questions comments into the chat or use the Q&A function especially when it comes to um, sending something to our speakers which I will moderate tonight as we go through but indeed let us know where you are in the chat where we're getting it from Gail is from Lindsay Ontario welcome I went to school at Fleming College um, in Lindsay. Now, if you're just joining us again for the first time, uh, the bird study group, our intentions are to bring people together uh, at night um, in a time where we're not all out in the field and distracted by the birds we see in here, but it still keeps our minds on what's occurring out there in the big birdie world. But we want to bring a broader conversation about birds, about bird ecology or threats, efforts, trends, or predictions to the table, and to amplify the voices of people making a difference out there in the world. Um, but we want to bring the average person, the beginner birder, the expert birder, all to the same place together to learn um, because there's always something new to learn every single day. Uh, I'd love to know, since it is the start of a new year, what your first bird of the year was. Did anyone take note of the first bird you encountered this year? Um, I woke up on New Year's morning to a singing American robin um, in my kind of backyard area here. Uh, so that was my first bird of the year. So let us know in the chat what your very first bird of the year was and what goals you have for 2023. Perhaps you're doing a big year. Um, perhaps you're giving yourself a new challenge. A couple years ago, um, several folks were doing the, the 5MR challenge, the 5 mile radius challenge. So do you have any goals this year for yourself? Um, getting people, okay, and I also wanna let you know if you are planning on, uh, chatting in the chat you can either chat to the panelists or to everyone there's a little drop down uh, function that says two and you can click everyone or you can send something just to the panelists um, so gail is from lindsay jean is the kw area welcome hello from toronto hey candace is in toronto marjorie's in dundas jean's first bird was an american finch peter's broadcasting or peter's connecting to us from waterloo retired curator of the earth sciences museum oh my gosh Welcome, Peter. That's amazing. Um, Marilyn, uh, pin up, pin up, pin up. I, I don't even know what that is. You're going to have to tell us a little bit later. And Marjorie says, a pileated woodpecker on January 1st. That's amazing. 
keep letting us know what did you see what was your first bird or where are you from tonight uh, some pretty great birds occurring in hamilton at the moment or in the hsa um, so the 40 kilometer radius spanning from dunder and castle this is not a photo that anyone has taken. I haven't seen a, a, a photo like this of the infamous great cormorant that's hanging out in the Hamilton Harbor or in Lake Ontario. The latest pictures are of like the wave break tower way out there on Lake Ontario and it's a tiny little speckle. Um, but I was hoping for one photo um, from Alvin Buckley. He did take a pretty great one of a great cormorant. Um, so it's a pretty interesting bird to have around and it's been here for a couple weeks now. I've, I've tried twice for it and missed both uh, chances on it, but it's still around. So a great cormorant. Uh, and the Audubon warbler was also quite a doozy to have around here. Um, and I think it was only around for a few days or maybe I think three days it was sighted for before it was gone. The yellow rumped myrtle warbler though is occurring still at Bayfront Park. Uh, even just today, a red shouldered hawk was reported um, in the study area. Um, I'm just going to quickly look up because th these are all shared on our on the Discord channel. Um, so in Oakville, um, around Upper Middle Road, was a red shouldered hawk today. So that's an interesting one. Uh, but cackling great greater white fronted goose have been reported recently. King Eider and the Harlequin duck uh, located. Uh, I think they're both females located around 50 point area in the in the Hamilton Conservation uh, Authority land. That throat has been seen, tundra swan, um, I guess at the Desjardins Canal, Sandhill Crane and Wilson Snipe kind of seen by the same person at the same time. Uh, so birders were flocking down to the Canal Park in Dundas to look for both of those birds, which are unusual birds to have anyway, but also in that area. Um, so that's cool to know. And there was a three-day wonder of a red-headed woodpecker um, seen at, a, at someone's house who I think shared it randomly on a Facebook photography page. And they, um, someone just happened to catch wind of it and messaged the person, went and saw it. So we did have a red-headed woodpecker seen in Hamilton right at, at, at Christmas time, like 24, 25, 26. So that's pretty cool. And I think probably the biggest rarity in the region currently in, in Lewis's woodpecker on Manitoulin Island. So quite a bit of chatter of folks wanting to go see uh, that bird, which is, I guess, probably close to where Maryland is, uh, way down west, down south and down west. I'm um, just checking back over to the chat. So Barb's tuning in from Thunder Bay. What cool birds are you seeing in Thunder Bay, Barb? Let us know. Marianne's saying a dark-eyed junco was her first bird um uh peter langballas uh northern harrier that's awesome and pat and lou saunders are tuning in from ancaster the bob's neighbors um hopefully you know bob is a is a great birdie neighbor i'm assuming you see him out there with binoculars a lot i know a lot of my neighbors like what are you looking at now um so i i i'm sure bob is teaching people a lot of cool things about birds in ancaster um past events recently we had the christmas bird count happen over three days so there's three bird counts that occur in our study area so did you take part in one i was able to take part uh, with my pal sterling in the flamborough bird count and we were in the lowville area and we were surprised that we didn't see a ton i think 17 species in the main patch that we had uh, it was a warm kind of rainy day december 30th i believe uh, but if you took pat, pat if you took part in a in a christmas bird count um what did you think of it at some point i'm going to hear probably from rob porter who is one of the the organizers of the cbc and we'll hear a little bit about the recap of, of how everything went but maybe you took part in a cbc elsewhere in in the world wherever you're tuning in from but some upcoming events so sunday january 29th from 10 until 12 uh, Joanne Hamilton, who is currently an employee of Royal Botanical Gardens, will be leading a hike through Hendry Valley. Uh, so you can show up uh, at Cherry Hill Gate at 10 o'clock on the 29th and take part in the in this walk. Uh, it's on the bus route, it's on the bike route, and there's uh, you pay for parking, but if you're an RBG member, just throw your membership in your dash and you should be good. Um, so that should be a fun outing. 
Um, our one of two employees, Jen Baker, for the Hamilton Naturalist Club is going to be co-leading a walk with Liam Thorne of the Iroquois Heights Conservation Area in the West Mountain, uh, kind of bordering Hamilton and Ancaster. So some really cool trails in there and a neat spot to, to look for wildlife. So if you're interested in getting out for, for an outing, that's on Saturday, February 4th from 1.30 until 3 p.m. Bird counters are continuing to take part in the Lake Ontario uh, important bird and biodiversity area counts. So if you're an avid waterfowler, you can tip your hat and uh, take part in this IBA count. You can reach out to past president Chris Motherwell uh, and he'll give you a location to survey. But all those dots that you see there are IBAs in Canada, quite a few um and you can learn more about what ibas are and perhaps what they're going to transition to uh, by checking out ibacanada.ca and i think lastly um the, there is going to be a visit of the hazeland swamp which is one of the naturalist club's most recent purchases uh, that's on saturday february 18th from 10 until 11 30 a.m uh, so once again, Jen Baker uh, is going to be, and members of the Sanctuary Committee will be leading a walk of this swamp. So easier to attend in the wintertime because the swamp is frozen and you might even require snowshoes depending on what's happening around that time. Though this winter, it's really hard to say if we're going to have that kind of time. Uh, so if you want to take part in any of these outings, you can take a look at our website, hamiltonnature.org, or reach out to any of us at any time we're an open book um and so if you're a member you probably already know this stuff but if you're just joining us and we're up to 58 people so far so welcome um we'd love to have you as part of the naturalist club we're a not-for-profit organization with two employees and a whole bunch of volunteers and a growing list of volunteers so if you would like to lend your help to the hnc we'd love to have you so consider becoming a member or volunteering and there's lots of ways to connect with the birding and the naturalist community uh, in the study area. So there are various ways to connect online. And I mentioned Discord earlier, and that's the growing one. But there's a Hamilton Naturalist Club Discord page. So it's not connected to the Ontario Field Ornithologists. It's just the HNC-driven Discord channel. Um, and it's been pretty quiet lately, which is fine. But if you would like to add any sightings, questions, or just generate conversation, you can look for um, the HNC Discord server uh, for all of that fun. And there are many groups that you can join, the Pippets, the Larks, um, not just a birding club, the Feminist Birding Club. There's, there's, there are quite a few ways to get yourself involved if you're a new or beginner birder and you just don't know where to begin. Lots of ways to connect with the community um, and to keep having fun. And if you ever have questions, comments, if you know somebody who um, would want to share their story or share the work that they're doing, uh, or an organization doing great things, reach out to me or um, reach out to Lou Mitten, who is our uh, who oversees our other monthly meetings. And we'd be happy to provide a space where folks can chat about um, whatever it is that they're doing to help uh, continue with the great work that's happening in the natural world. Um, I'm, in the previous slide, our monthly publication, The Wood Duck, is a spot where a lot of this goes. And uh, many thanks to Michael Rollins, who is here tonight, who is recording all of these meetings and then takes them and um, puts it into a, a great story, which then goes into The Wood Duck for those who aren't able to attend and they can then read up on it afterward. But we're always looking for people to contribute to The Wood Duck. Uh, and maybe after tonight, it will inspire you to put pen to paper or fingers to keyboard and, uh, and to put your thoughts out there. Our next uh, bird study group meeting is happening at the end of February. So we're doing a bit of a date shift due to the family day weekend. So um, this meeting is going to occur on Monday, February 27th. And from the Finch Research Network, Ryan Mandelbaum will be talking to us all about America's crossbills, both white wing, but I think predominantly red wing. Um, they were mentioning to me how there's going to be a not a study um there's there's something coming out recently that that they were saying 
connects to the latest call variant of red crossbills. It's 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 perhaps a new family um, of red crossbills that have been found. So there's going to be something released very soon, and Ryan will tell us all about it uh, at the end of February. So I'm really keen, and Ryan will be coming to at us coming to us from New York. Uh, I connected with them via social media and they've got some pretty cool stuff to say. So I'm looking forward to that. I hope you tune back in in February uh, to that meeting. And so for tonight, like as I mentioned earlier, we have two special guests. And how this is going to work is each presenter, each author is going to have 15 to 20 minutes to tell us a little bit about themselves and the book or the books that they've written. And then we're going to open it up to some dialogue between the three of us, but of course to all of us. So I really want to encourage you to think of some questions um, that you would like to have answered by our authors. Because this is a first, at least in the last couple of years, for the Bird Study Group is to have special guests being two authors. So our first one that we're going to hear from is Bob Bell. So Bob was born and raised in Northern Ontario, spent 35 years as a mineral exploration geologist, working globally as both a field geologist and later as an executive. At some point in his travels, he contracted Lyme disease, which led to his premature retirement at the age or at the end of 2015. I'm going to not read the rest of this. I'm going to stop sharing my screen so I can allow Bob to do so because I know that Bob has a lot of great things to share with us. And when Bob's done, I'm going to introduce our next speaker. So let's hand the floor over. Thank you so much to Bob Bell. There, thanks, Jackson. Hopefully everybody can see this now. It's good. So uh, welcome and thanks for attending. Uh, this is the cover of my new book that was finally released in... Uh, in December, it's been very frustrating. It should have come out about two years ago, but thanks to COVID, uh, you know, the supply chains got backed up. And, and my understanding is uh, for the uh, printing business, it was very bad that the, the problem was that the paper that would normally be used for books, that pulp was going into cardboard boxes because the entire world was shopping online. So here we are, it's finally out. I'm very proud to say my daughter, Candace, uh, painted the cover. I had this concept of tying together my Lyme disease with my passion for birding by having a, a bird stomp on a giant tick. And I think Candace did a, a great job of, uh, of capturing that concept. And kudos to my son, Trevor, who's a digital designer. He was very helpful uh, in, that, in that regard. And so while I'm doing acknowledgements, thanks again, Jackson and the Bird Study Group for inviting me. Uh, to build them on for having featured my book on the back cover of the uh, November Wood Duck. Uh, thanks to three prominent uh, Ontario birders who were kind enough to read a, an advanced review copy and write really nice blurbs that are in the book. Paul Riss, Chris Early, and Julie Zarankin. And if you haven't read Julia's book, Field Notes from an Unintentional Birder, please do so. It's a great read. Now, a lot of new birders like to talk about their spark bird, the one that got them hooked into birding. And, and I don't have such a bird per se, but what I do have is a spark Hamilton Naturalist Club field trip. It was led by Rob Dobus and Cheryl Edgecombe back in May of 2016 out in Flamborough. And I learned a lot. I saw a lot of cool birds and I, I made some new friends and in particular, a shout out to Peter Tholm and Barry Coombs who mentored me and have become uh, really great friends. And so that was it. That's what really hooked me. But back when I was working, I'd give a lot of corporate presentations and my lawyers always insisted on a, a legalese slide called a forward-looking statement. And then the forward-looking statement basically says, you can't believe anything I'm about to tell you will come true. So nothing's really changed. I'm a geologist and an amateur birder. I'm not a doctor, so I'm only relaying my own experiences and understanding of what transpired. I'm not giving medical advice. And I just, when I, when I say amateur birder, I should just mention Marilyn's book um, touches on this topic uh, multiple times and, and has really interesting discussions about amateur birders versus professional ornithologists. So a quick word about me, actually Jackson's covered a lot of this already. I grew up in Northern Ontario in the Sioux. 
my dad was a high school science teacher and vice principal, and I really owe him everything. He's the one that instilled in me an absolute love of science of all kinds, from entomology to astronomy, uh, nature and the great outdoors. So it's not surprising I ended up working outdoors as a geologist. Here's some of the places I've worked and or traveled uh, over the years. I spent 35 years in the mineral exploration business, um, primarily looking for gold, but, but many other commodities as well, everything from nickel and iron to diamonds. And when I had to retire, I was serving as the CEO of a Toronto Stock Exchange listed uh, junior mining company. So I want to say I am an accidental author. I wrote this book initially for myself. It was just cathartic to get it off my chest. It was such a struggle. Um, but on a whim, I submitted it to a few Canadian publishers, and I got very lucky, and here I am. So I'm very humbled to be on a panel with a professional author. And, and Marilyn, it's a real honor to be uh, here with you. And I, I found this cartoon, which has cracked me up. The woman sitting at a computer looking out the window and two birds talking. And judging by the amount of time that she's spending staring at the window at us, she's either a very committed ornithologist or a very unfocused writer. And I'm probably guilty on, on both accounts. So I like to illustrate my talks. And you know, typically, I would have pictures of Ontario birds, but there's no point in that with this audience. So I went back through my, my work archives and dug out pictures that I'd taken while I was working internationally. And I thought, A, they'd be more interesting to you. And B, they demonstrate that I've always been interested in birds, even before that spark field trip. You know, so a lot of people ask me, well, where in the world did you get your contract line? And the short answer is, I've got no idea. I'm not aware of ever having a tick bite like many people, and I'll, I'll come to that in a minute. But as you can see from that map, I've worked all over the world. I've been exposed to pathogens globally. You know, all I do know is when the symptoms appear. But, but first, just I'd, I'd like to make a, a couple of comments about ticks. And, and please, I don't mean to fear monger, but, but there are some things I want you to know. Now, I stole these photos off uh, Twitter. And it was somebody in the Long Point area that posted them. And I regret I didn't take down who it was, so I can't acknowledge or thank them or get their approval for using them. Uh, the, the, the point I want to make here is that ticks can be quite tiny and infectious, even at the nymph stage when they're the size of a pinhead. You can see how tiny that is. I, I've got no idea if this is a, a deer tick and whether it's um, infected with Lyme. But you know, I'm sure many of you have seen pictures of fully engorged embedded ticks, but, but look at how tiny this is. If you have a lot of moles or freckles like I do, or what if your skin tone was a little bit darker, you can see why less than 50% of Lyme patients are aware of having a tick. In fact, I just read a paper last week, they're saying it may be more like less than 30% are aware of a tick. And then of, of those, only about half get the so-called diagnostic bullseye rash. And yet our government messaging still seems to be to this day that if and only if you find an embedded tick and if you have a bullseye rash, then seek treatment. So the problem is the ticks don't just pass on Lyme. The Lyme bacteria is called Borrelia, but the ticks are carrying all kinds of other things. So most Lyme patients, including myself, end up with what are called co-infections. And the most common of these are Babesia, a parasite, and Bartonella, another bacteria. Uh, my guess, and this is a non-medical, non-scientific guess, is why every Lyme patient seems to have a slightly unique set of symptoms or maybe a unique time frame to get a little bit better or not cured or, or totally cured. Maybe it's due to the varying ratios of the the toxic load they've got depending on, on the pathogens. Uh, Babesia, for example, you'll notice my voice starts getting croaky. Uh, Babesia attacks the red blood cells, but it also gets into the lungs and esophagus. And, and I think that, that causes my, my voice to get very uh, raspy. So when it began in September of 2013, I was just back uh, living in downtown Toronto from two back-to-back -back trips one through Southern Africa and one out to Saskatchewan. And shortly after those trips, I woke up with massive cold chills and a high fever. And I remember thinking, oh, oh, 
because I had contracted dengue fever from the Brazilian Amazon. And I can still remember the, the infectious disease doctor doing this, don't get it again. Because the second time can be um, uh, go hemorrhagic and, and, and potentially be fatal. But dengue fever runs about eight, 10 days. This lasted about two, so I totally forgot about it. And then about a month later, bizarre things started to happen. And um, in hindsight, those, that cold chill and fever in September was either the initial onset of Lyme that I'd contracted on one of those trips, or it was a random, random infection which triggered latent Lyme. My Lyme doctor an expert from the States told me that she figured you could carry Lyme unknowingly for up to 10 years, and then it might be triggered by, by an infection. So the symptoms, the first thing that, that happened was all of a sudden, every morning when I woke up, the side I'd been sleeping on stayed as, uh, asleep. That, that numb pins and needles, a sleep sensation, that arm and shoulder, I'd have to shake it out. And then a few days later, I started developing what I call migratory muscle pain. Like my bicep would be just throbbing. And then within an hour or two, it would be my tricep. And then a little bit later in my upper back, and the bottom line is Lyme affects every major body system. One of the biggest ones is neurological. Um, I've got permanent peripheral neuropathy. So that's pins and needles, numbness, burning, tingling in the extremities, burning in the tops of my feet, my fingers uh, numb, tingling. I've got a very strong tremor in my hands, um, loss of balance. I was very bad and needed a cane for a long time when I was at peak Lyme. Cognitive issues, which I'm embarrassed to say, do continue on. They're kindly called brain fog. Um, anxiety, you can, I can get just crippling anxiety if I have to have any sort of commitment or in a big crowd or noise. And drastic mood swings, which is not me. I was never like that. And, and yet Lyme causes all this. Um, it's in my joints. I developed uh, what's called crepitus, and that's the snap, crackle, pop that you can get. I can do it on demand in my wrists and my, my thumb joint. In my book, I, I joke that the crepitus was a good term because I felt like I was becoming decrepit. I've got very bad arthritis in my neck. Um, it affected my muscles that I could sit and see a muscle in my arm twitching, like visibly twitching up and down for maybe 10, 20 seconds. Um, my heart would go out of rhythm. It felt like forever. It was probably only eight, 10 seconds, but it would boom, 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 which would just freak me out. And I, you know, I get really winded, but there's more. Um, it felt like my internal thermostat was broken. It was like I was running hot all the time, really sweating and hot. Um, roaring tinnitus to the point now I'm really losing my hearing because I cannot hear over the, I'd estimate 80, 100 decibels in my, in my head. And to this day, I have this, I won't call it mega fatigue anymore. Back in the day when I was peak, I would absolutely hit the wall by one o'clock and I would sleep for three hours, just right out. But now I pretty much need a nap most days in the afternoon. So, you know, Lyme is called the great imitator. And this is part of the problem in trying to be diagnosed because they want to run through all these other neurological diseases, almost like a process of, of elimination. So you know, I, I've essentially got all of the symptoms of Parkinson's, some of them of ALS and, and MS. <clears throat> and what's really interesting as an aside is Canada has the highest rate of MS in the world. And the standard explanation given for that is because we live so far north, we don't get enough sunshine and therefore enough vitamin D and then that cascades down and causes these problems. Well, you know, I would beg to argue that there's five or 600 million Europeans living further north than we are. And we just forget how far north Europe is because it's artificially warmed by the Gulf Stream. So my personal belief is that our high rate of MS, that excess rate may be misdiagnosed line. So here I was battling the conventional medical system. I'm just gonna give you a few of the quotes that absolutely drove me crazy as I tried to get a diagnosis. So when I woke up every morning and everything was asleep, I went to my doctor and he said, well, it's just the way you're sleeping. You know, and I thought I'm 58, you know, this, this is new. So what was going on? Then I did get referred to a neurologist and I had some tests for, for MS. 
and including a brain MRI. And, and he literally, with a smirk on his face, did this and said, I'm sorry, you don't have a neurological disease, but no curiosity or interest to figure out, well, what is going on? And then when I ultimately did get my, my diagnosed, you know, le, uh, blood lab diagnosis from the States, which I'll talk about in the next slide, but my Canadian doctor says, well, of course they found you positive. They want your business. And he, he has no idea what he's talking about. The lab only does, uh, it's only a diagnostic lab. There's no financial incentive or ulterior motive to find you positive. So then I got referred to, at the time, the top infectious disease doctor in Toronto. And he said, I will evaluate Bob for everything but Lyme. So I took a hard pass. Um, and then, you know, back to the other doctor. And he says, well, where in the world could you have gotten Lyme as if it doesn't exist here? So then I, I thought I had a brainstorm and I thought, okay, I'm going to get into a younger doctor, one that may be more Lyme literate. So I managed to get into one that just graduated from UAT. Told her that I was starting to see my Lyme doctor in the U.S. And all she could say was, well, if you're spending all that money in the States, buyer beware. So my daughter, Candace, made me laugh. She said, Dad, you would have been better off going to a vet. You know, we treat our dogs with more respect. They get inoculated. They have a, a vaccine for, for Lyme. So take away my, my one bit of advice is you have to be your own medical advocate. And the problem is you're doing it at the worst possible time. You've got no energy. You're anxious. You're worried, you're wondering what the hell's happening to my body, there's something going on, and yet all these doctors are dismissive. So it's a challenge and you have to keep pushing. If you don't push for yourself, nobody else is gonna do it for you. I was lucky in that friends helped. I just happened to have a friend who had another friend who has Lyme. And so she suggested, she was the first to plant the word Lyme in my brain because she recognized the symptoms. Um, another friend suggested that I go see an alt doctor in Toronto who was conducting this galvanic skin electrodermal testing. I won't get into it. It seemed very bizarre and weird, but he ran me, he ran his testing for uh, different frequencies for 240 parasites, bacteria, and viruses. And lo and behold, I lit up on six of them. And every one of them was either a Lyme strain or one of the co-infections. And he, he was an Australian and he says, it's a spirocket, mate. And, and he's trying to say spirochete or spirochete. And, and the spirochete, the Lyme bacteria, it's called a spirochete because it's spiral shaped. And I, if I understood correctly, that's why I had mus uh, migratory muscle pain because they're literally screwing their way through your muscles as they move around. Uh, so I, I did find out that there's, like I say, there's a state of the art blood lab in Silicon Valley, California, called Igenix. And, and I had my blood work done that and came back and I was right off the chart full of antibi antibodies against Lyme. So, you know, that was my Lyme diagnosis. And with that, I got myself in to see Dr. Maureen McShane, who practiced in upstate New York, Plattsburgh. Uh, she's now retired, but she was like the rock star of Lyme doctors for Canadians. She had, when I was going, she had 1,500 patients and about 95% were Canadian. She cycled me on and off over about two, two and a half years, uh, heavy doses of antibiotics and a strict diet. And, you know, with that, eventually uh, she asked me, how much better do you think you are? And I put an estimate of about 60% better. I didn't have to walk with a cane anymore. But I still was not in any condition to work the way of, you know, working. I was working internationally, a lot of work. and. South America, traveling constantly, on and off airplanes, restaurant meals, I just couldn't handle it. So I had to retire, uh, relocated to Ancaster, got very lucky and found a home basically surrounded by forest that's contiguous with the Dundas Valley Conservation. Uh, instantly put up bird feeders and was mesmerized by the tons of birds that were coming to my feeders. Um, I instantly started to uh, research the birds that first winter uh, 2016. And I noticed that I'm sitting at my desk, I'm reading on boat birds, I'm looking out the window at my feeders. And when I'm doing that, I was so fixated, I wasn't aware of my body. I, I wasn't feeling my constant uh, aches and pains. And like I say, I went on that field trip in the spring, 2016, and that was it, I was hooked. And the more I went birding, the less pain I was experiencing. 
So it, it's obviously not a cure, but it is a great coping mechanism. And I apologize, I realize it's quite corny, but, but I put in my book that, that BIRDS is an acronym, birding inevitably reduces disease symptoms. Certainly does for me. So I could go on and on about the virtues of birding, like why am I passionate about birding? But to do that with this audience is like preaching to the choir. So I just wanna focus on two main reasons for me. And the big main one is the mindfulness aspect of it. It's the mental calming, the soothing, it's getting into the zone, that excitement of seeing a lifer or you know, seeing a new uh, behavior of a bird, something, a best look ever. It totally gets my mind off my body, out of my body, and helps me co cope with what I call my limitations. Now you'll notice I've jumped from my international birds to back to an Ontario bird that's deliberate because I took this on that field trip with Rob and Cheryl back in 2016. The second big reason I'm really passionate about it is, is the friends I've made. Um, throughout my life, and I'm, I'm gonna call that BB, and I don't mean for Bob Bell, I mean for before birding. Because before birding, my friends, long-term friends were ones I made as a child in school um, or work colleagues. But folk, friends now are folks from all walks of life and we share this intense shared passion and you know the joy of seeing a lifer together with someone. You, you, you just can't compare that to other kinds of friendships. You know, I just never thought it possible to gain so many friends um, at my age. So, you know, thank all of you. And please, if any of you recognize me after this, you see me out in the trails and we haven't met, please stop and introduce yourself because I, I'd love to meet you. But please don't let your fear of Lyme ruin your enjoyment. You know, like I said, I don't want to fear monger. Um, I listed all those symptoms. And, and the reason for that is I want you to be aware of them, but I don't, you know, if, if somebody in the audience saying, oh my God, I've got that symptom. doesn't mean you got Lyme, but I'm hoping that if you have a subset of those symptoms, at least the word line is in your brain and you're thinking about it because it wasn't in mine. And by the time it was, it was too late. So just remember, not every bug bite, and I put bug in, in quotes because you know ticks are not insects, they're arthropods. So not every bug bite is a tick bite and not every tick is a deer tick or a black-legged tick. And not every deer tick is, is infected with Lyme. So just some basic, simple precautions that possible stay out of tall grass, you know, tuck your pants into your socks. I like wearing tall rubber boots and do a thorough body check um, when you're home. Uh, <laughs> like this uh, romantic couple, I can't see the caption here, but I wrote it down. When we get back to the cabin, I'll open the champagne, build a nice fire and we can examine each other for ticks. So, once you are aware of encountering a tick, act quickly because the clock is ticking and that pun is intentional. Because Lyme is curable if treated immediately. I've had a couple of friends in the last year or so call me and say, Bob, Bob, I had an embedded tick. I took it to the doctor. He doesn't want to treat me. He wants to send it away. He or she wants to send it away and have the tick tested first. And if it comes back positive, then he'll treat me with antibiotics. And I, I said I wasn't going to give medical advice, but on this one, you need to push back and insist on getting on antibiotics right away because, because it could take months for that tick to be tested. And by then, perhaps it's too late for you. I was 13 months from infection to diagnosis. And by then, I'm, I'm living with chronic Lyme. It's, it's not going away. So obviously there's a lot more information in my book about all this, about navigating the medical system, more details on the treatments I took and my, a lot of more description on my joys of birding. And I, I talked about 5MR birding. That was really special to me because it made me realize that if I get worse with Lyme or just aging in general, I don't have to travel far to get my fix. I live in a wonderfully birdy area. My book might be a great resource for you if you're trying to convince a family member or friend to get into birding and they're, they're resisting a bit because I, I do provide a lot of resources. It won't be anything new to most of the audience, but I give information on various types of bird feeders, birding apps, bird books, webcams, nest cams, 
uh, my preferred websites, and even Facebook groups. So here's a photo of the trail that goes around Mary Orchard, which is in the Dundas Valley, just up the road from me. It's it's an area I consider my my local patch. I've found some uh, fantastic, cool birds there, including like a barred owl, a, a northern shrike, and a Connecticut warbler. And you know, doesn't that look soothing, even without a bird in the photo? So to me, birding leads to serenity, and serenity leads to coping chronic pain and illness. So like my title says, you know, get out of the limelight and into the sunlight. And I wish you all good birding and good health. And thank you for, uh, for your time. Well, I'm, I'm grateful to be one of the people who um, is in your friend list now, Bob, and it was through birding. So thank you so much for for sharing um, your story with us, and we're gonna we're gonna get to it uh, a little bit more about it. But what a harrowing tale, and I'm so glad you were able to put um, your words to paper, and like you said, to be able to share with the world um, a, your story, um, so that it could perhaps resonate with others, or even just to allow you to express yourself. Um, so thank, thank you. you so much. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna put you on mute while I introduce our next. Um, presenter and I'm just gonna quickly share my screen to introduce Marilyn so um, coming to us from nowhere close to Hamilton Ontario is Marilyn Simons who's the author of over of 20 books including the nonfiction classic The Convict Lover Gutenberg's Fingerprint uh, and the novel The Holding, a New York Times review of books. Um, so the founding artistic director of the Kingston Writers Fest, Simons is an influential champion of writers and writing. She lives with writer and translator Wayne Grady and divides her time between Kingston, Ontario and San Miguel, a -N -De, San Miguel de Allende. Oh, I probably got that wrong. Uh, her latest book is an innovative memoir uh, or biography, Woman Watching, Louise de the, oh, I, I was practicing this all day. I'm going to stop talking to let world-renowned author Marilyn Simons take the stage here and share with us a little bit about her book and her experiences. Hello. Uh, oh, you've disappeared. Are you still there? <laughs> Thank you very much, Jackson. Um, and thank you, Bob, for that incredible uh, presentation. I, I used to live in Northern Ontario where, where ticks were very common. And uh, that cartoon was quite hilarious because every time we went outside for a walk, we had to come back and like do the full body check. Um, and it's a pleasure to be here with a room full of, uh, of birders. I can't see you, but I know you're there and I hope you'll have lots and lots of questions. That's the favorite part of, of mine, of a, of a presentation like this. I should say that um, my internet was kind of lagging a bit during uh, Jackson's talk and Bob's. And so I hope that doesn't happen with me. If it does, uh, let me know in the chat. I'm gonna give you a really brief introduction to Louise de Kirlene Lawrence, a remarkable self-trained ornithologist who lived and worked in the Northern Ontario bush in the second half of the last century. Um, a woman of many lives who eventually turned her back on all of them to devote herself exclusively to birds. And in the process, she became one of Canada's most significant amateur naturalists and nature writers. Um, so I'm going to turn on the PowerPoint now. It's just going to take me a second, but I'm not going to go away. You will find me in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. Okay, it's loading, so it's not going to take too long. Um, oops, everything good here? Okay, can you guys see this? I hope so. So far, it's a black screen still, Marilyn. It should be there in just one moment. There you are. Actually, probably 10 seconds. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Am I there? Am I good. there? I'm inside there. Okay. We're all good. You're good. So Louise grew up with birds. Um, her first words, <laughs> according to the family, was uh, not mama or papa, but craw, craw, the sound of the hooded crows that were in her area. 
She was born into incredible privilege. Her father was Chamberlain of the court of King Gustav V. Her godmother was Queen of Denmark. Um, and she spent her first 17 years on a vast family estate called Svenskund uh, on the Baltic Sea. Her father, um, whom she adored, and there's a, oops, I guess I should get it out of the way. There's a picture of, of her on the right there uh, with her father when she's two years old. Her father was a noted conservationist. And with some of his friends, he started the world's second conservation area. The first was Yellowstone. And the one that he and his friends started was on Carlso Island in the Baltic. And they bought up the, all the land on the island in order to save the razorbill ox that were in danger of extinction there from egg collecting. So she was the eldest of two daughters. So she expected to inherit Svenskund. But when her father died suddenly, the estate had to be sold for debts. And she had to move into a small apartment in Stockholm with her mother and her sister. When the First World War erupted, she put her privilege aside and uh, trained as a Red Cross nurse. She was posted to a Russian prisoner of war camp where she fell in love with Gleb, Nikolay, uh, Gleb Kirilin Nikolaevich. And that's uh, Louise and Gleb on the right there. He was an officer in the White Russian Army. They married and she followed him to Archangel a city just inside the Arctic Circle. And that's where the white Russians were taking a last stand against the Bolsheviks in the last days of the Russian Civil War. The whites uh, were defeated and Gleb and Louise joined a thousand sleigh loads of refugees and soldiers racing through blizzards in February towards the Finnish border and freedom. And if you've seen Dr. Zhivago, that's the scene they were in. Um, unfortunately, they didn't make it, and they were captured and sent to a Bolshevik prison in Moscow, and there Gleb disappeared. So Louise and Gleb had planned to emigrate to Canada, a country that was a great deal like Sweden and Russia, but without the politics. Um, and in 1926, Louise emigrated alone. She had spent four years staying in Russia looking for her husband, and uh, eventually decided to come to Canada alone. She was hired by the Canadian Red Cross to set up a Red Cross outpost hospital in Bonfield, Ontario. And if you, you know your Ontario geography, that's just above um, Algonquin Park. And this was, this was a new experiment in healthcare where a community would provide the house and the Red Cross would pay for the, for the nurse. And she provided healthcare to families scattered across 2,500 square kilometers. In summer, she visited them in her Model T Ford named Henrietta, and you see that on the left. And in winter, she visited them by dog sled. I'll just move over a little bit so you can see the dogs. Um, she trained the dogs herself and she learned to mush, uh, which gives you some idea of the kind of outdoors person she was and the strength and resourcefulness of this remarkable woman. Um, in the spring of 1934, one of Louise's mothers, Elzir Dion, gave birth to the world's first quintuplets to survive more than one day. Um, so she became nurse in charge of the Dion quintuplets and brought them successfully through their first year. However, the, there was, as, as you probably know, there was an incredible media circus around the quints, and this was too much for Louise. She bought a piece of wilderness on Pimsey Bay a bulge uh, in, I don't know if you know where Pimsey Bay is, but um, if you think of Mattawa and North Bay, Pimsey Bay is almost directly in the middle between those two. And it's kind of a bulge in the Mattawa River. And she retired there uh, in 1935 to a three room log cabin, very primitive, uh, no running water, no electricity. And she retired there to write a book about the quints. She didn't know it, but she had, uh, she had stumbled upon a really privileged location where the southern limit of the northern breeding birds overlaps with the northern limit of the southern breeding birds, making it an especially rich area uh, for birds. But none of the birds that she knew from Sweden uh, appeared in those woods. Her hired man, Len, whom she eventually married, taught her the names of the common northern bird species, uh, chickadees, woodpicks, whiskey jacks, but the brightly colored birds that arrived in the spring to nest there 
were a mystery to her. So as I said, she and Len were married and then he immediately went off to the Second World War. Uh, so for six years, Louise was alone in the woods uh, with the birds and she learned to identify them. Oh, this is her, sorry, I kind of skipped this one. This is, this is the map for Pimacy Bay and uh, this is her cabin in the woods. So Louise had to learn her, her birds exclusively from books, which is really hard, I think, for us to imagine where, you know, we have bird walks with friends, we have the internet, etc. But she mostly used Percy Taverner's Birds of Canada. That's her on the left with Birds of Canada, which is really too big, if you know the book, too big to carry into the woods. So she also bought uh, the Chapman and Chester A. Reed bird books, which are small bird guides, uh, small enough to fit into a pocket. Um, taking those books and draped in ferns, as Chapman advised, with a cushion pinned to the hem of her coat so she could flip it under her to sit on a stump or a snowbank as she watched the birds. She learned to identify species this way, but she also was observing closely the behavior of the birds that were her only companions through those years. Louise was curious by nature and persistent, some might say dogged, stubborn. She wanted to know everything about the birds. So she turned to experts like Percy Cap Taverner, Earl Godfrey, who wrote the second edition of Birds in Canada, both of them at the National Museum of Natural Sciences in Ottawa, Jim Bailey at the ROM. And she entered into correspondences with them, writing them over a hundred letters each, about her sightings and peppering them with questions, which they remarkably um, answered in incredible detail. They introduced her also to other keen birders, um, not only in Canada, but uh, around the world. Uh, so there you have um, uh, Margaret Morris Nice in the bottom left, um, Doris and Murray Spears above them, in the middle, Percy Taverner, on the right, Moy, um, Roy Iver from Mississauga, who you, I'm sure you're familiar with. So she ended up exchanging uh, thousands of letters with all the great professional and amateur ornithologists of the day, not only in North America, but also Europe and Central America. Uh, one of her main correspondences was Alexander Scutch. And if you don't know about him, I, I really strongly urge you to look him up. Uh, Louise was encouraged to start a daily bird record, a practice that she continued for more than 40 years, uh, keeping meticulous notes. It, here, these are some of her notebooks. Um, they're now stored in Library and Archives Canada in 26 bankers boxes, which was a huge resource for me in writing this book. The number of birds she counted on her little three acre patch of forest in a single day is astonishing. Now, she didn't see all these birds in one particular day, but on, on one day, she saw 55 chimney switches, on another 26 veeries, on another 33 red-eyed vireos. I mean, can you imagine 33 red-eyed vireos being in your woods at the same moment? She also kept an astonishing number of nests under observation. Through the 1946 breeding season, for instance, she made notes on 62 nests. But Louise being Louise, she wasn't satisfied with just watching. And so she asked Taverner what else she could do to make a contribution. And he said, why not take up banding? I don't think anyone can really know a bird until they've held it in their hand. And so for 17 years, from 1942 to 1959, Louise operated the most northerly banding station in Ontario. She built all the traps herself. She learned what the birds wanted, how they fed in order to bait them properly. And my suspicion is, although I don't know this, I haven't been able to do the research, um, but I suspect it was, it was one of the few uh, banding stations operated by a woman. She decided that what was lacking was a, a well-conducted, long-term regional study. So a study of one particular area over many, many years. And so with this in mind, she mapped her property and began intensive studies in the behavior of birds about which 
almost nothing was known at the time. So this, this slide is on the right is her map of the red-eyed vireo territories that she had under study and one of her nesting cards. One of her most famous studies was of a dawn to dust birdsong count of the red-eyed vireo, which she followed through the woods on one day for 14 hours from about four in the morning to about six, while it sang a record of 22,197 songs. She also did a landmark nesting study that recorded the unique calls and songs of that bird and noted for the first time that within their territory, they defined a distinct nesting area for the female and a distinct singing area for the male. And if you look closely at that map, you can see that the, the large circle is, is the nesting area of a pair. And within it, there are two smaller circles that indicate where where the, where the um, nest area was and where the singing area was. And she wrote um, as a, she, she wrote a huge 30 page study on, on the red eyed vireo um, that upturned many of the conventional ideas about that bird. Um, but the first study that kind of propelled her uh, into the ornithological limelight, and I'm spelling that L-I-M, uh, Bob, <laughs> and all the rest of you. Uh, but her first study was a nest watch of Canada Jays. This is hard for us to imagine what, you know, in the Google world, we think we know everything about everything. But in the 1940s, there had never been a nest watch of the Canada Jays. And because the Canada Jays build their nest deep in the boreal forest. They're gregarious in summer, but very shy nesters. And they lay their eggs in March and nobody could figure out how on earth they could uh, incubate the eggs at a time when there was not only no food around, but also um, deep snows and, and you know killing cold. And in her studies, she, she determined what she saw was two birds, um, uh, sitting on, on the eggs and brooding one on top of the other. Her most significant study, however, was a 13-year study of the decline of warblers in her woods through the 1940s and the early 1950s. And she linked the decline of those birds and, and uh, the chestnut-sided and the, um, the Canada warbler, both uh, declined by 75% during that time, which, which cannot be accommodated for by, you know, normal changes in food supply, et cetera. But, and she did two further studies that fairly convincingly uh, linked that decline to the roadside spring of chemicals. And she did this a dozen years before Rachel Carson published Silent Spring, which is why uh, Louise de Caroline Lawrence in her day was often referred to as Canada's Rachel Carson. So altogether, she published almost 100 articles in popular and scientific journals, as well as six books. She was actually the, uh, remains to this day, the most frequent contributor to Audubon magazine. Her second book, The Lovely in the Wild, was awarded the John Burroughs Medal, the highest accolade in nature writing in the English language. And she was the first Canadian woman to receive the prize. She was also the first woman to be awarded the Doris Hustis Spears Award that is given by the Society of Canadian Ornithologists to, quote, an individual who's made an outstanding contribution, lifetime contribution to Canadian ornithology. She published all over the world, including four articles in the Wood Duck um, in the 1950s and 60s. Many of her conclusions about birds are now being proved true, that she believed firmly that bird song is language and that chickadees remember where they've hoarded the seed in the forest and retrieve it in order. Some of her key studies still stand today as foundational in particular, her comparative study on four species of woodpeckers, which is still cited on Cornell's All About Birds website. Well into her 90s, she continued her daily dawn bird walk, keeping notes on arrival and departure dates, nesting, migration, all the bird behaviors that fascinated. And she was always driven by her mantra, because you see a bird, 
you do not know it. She advocated close observation and what today is called slow birding. Her goal was to know birds as they are, to peel away human assumptions and our own need to use birds to our purposes, but rather to know them for what they are, to understand how they live in the world and perhaps to thus live better ourselves. So I knew Louise, which is what made this book a real pleasure to write. I wrote a profile of her for Harold Smith Magazine, if you remember that magazine, back in 1989. And she asked me at that time to be her biographer. She died in 1992, 30 years ago, last spring. And through the decades since then, I've pondered how to fulfill that promise to her. Um, we, we both lived actually um, as, as a bird flies, maybe 15, 20 minutes from each other in the Northern Ontario woods, uh, south of North Bay. I wanted the reader to get to know her the way I had through her own voice. And luckily I had those 26 bankers boxes of letters and speeches and scrapbooks. And she was quite a saver, thank goodness. Um, in not only Library and Archives Canada, but she had materials and archives right across the continent. I also wanted to share with the reader the process of researching her life. I wanted to take you, the reader, into the reading room of Library and Archives Canada, into the bird vaults of the ROM and what it was like to be surrounded by 140,000 dead birds. I wanted to share the ethical dilemma of telling the life story of someone whom I knew only for about the last decade of her life. So I came to see the book as part memoir, a memoir of the writing of the book, but also a memoir of my own life with birds, because like Louise, I've been watching birds since I was a little girl. But it wasn't until about 10 years ago when I started living half the year in Mexico in the wintering grounds of some of the birds that, that we live with when they are uh, nesting in Ontario in the summer, that I became intensely aware of bird migration and what that might mean for them. And my own migrations north to south and of Louise's migrations from Sweden to Russia to Canada and back again, and what those migrations mean to us as individuals and as a species. So finally, I could see myself my way through to writing the, left, the, the life of this remarkable woman through stories lifted from letters and speeches and her research studies told largely in her own words, the birds of my childhood and my birds of the South interfeathered with hers of the North and the entire process from beginning to end visible. And where this story ends is, is here in her log cabin where I spent um, time writing the final chapters of this book. And on the right there is the inside of the cabin with a lovely fire burning in September and my manuscript laid out as I did a final re revision. I walked the paths that she walked. I paused to take in the same views. I canoed up to Talon Chute as she had done many, many days. I noted the birds passing through on their way south, those that never arrived and those that remained. All that was still the same and all that was different. Never one day alike to the other, as she so liked to say. So thank you very much for, for listening. Um, I'm looking forward to talking to Bob and Jackson about the book, about writing, about birds and writing. Um, and I, I do want to just direct you for a moment, if I may, if you haven't already gone to my website, there's a documentary there where you can actually hear Louise's voice. Um, my son who's a sound engineer, my, my granddaughter who's a filmmaker made the film. And my son was able to take the interview tapes that I did in 1989 and clean them up, thank goodness, so that you can hear Louise's voice herself. And uh, that's the voice that I have tried to convey within this book. So um, I'm going to unshare my screen now so that we can all talk together. So let me make sure I do this and don't leave. There I am. Hi. Wow. Um, I, I, I think the next stage of this is, is making a movie based on what you've just described based on the book based on 
I got, I do want to go into the archives and into the ROM. Like that would be s such a neat transition to see this all happen. Marilyn, thank you yeah. so much. Thank you. Um, th and again, thank you both so much for being here uh, tonight and for 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 pouring your your hearts and your brains into these books. My, I'm gonna. Before I ask my first couple of questions, once again, remind folks to use the Q&A and the chat, either or, it doesn't matter, to input any questions you may have for our authors tonight. Um, my, my first question to you um, is, is, what did you learn about yourself when writing this, these books or your book? What is something that, you know, as a beginner author or on your 20th book, what is something that you can step back and look at and say that you learned about yourself in that, in that process? Bob, you can go first. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's a good question. You know, while I was still working, uh, my, my business partner, the, the president of the company, she, she said, you know, you really should go and, and get some counseling to deal you must you must have this anger at the world that, that this is happening to you and you're being forced into retirement and i learned through writing it that that i i didn't have any anger it was like it, it is what it is birds save me and and uh you know, would have been a waste of money for me to go to a counselor the best counseling is out in the forest with with the birds so so there that's well for for me as a as a woman, especially, um, and I should say, there's a whole chapter in in the book about the the legacy of women watchers that Louise stepped into when she became uh, interested in birds. I mean, she was not the first uh, sort of you know eccentric woman wandering the bush looking at birds. It 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 goes right you know you you can trace it right back to I think uh, the earliest one I have is 1832. Um, uh, a, a woman in um, in Quebec who who countered a French ornithologist who 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 declared that uh, Canadian birds have or at the time North American Northern North American birds do not have bird song um, because he had he had traveled in Northern North America um, in the in the in the dead of summer and in winter and and she of course lived in Quebec right on a major flyway and she knew that birds sang beautifully you know in this in the spring and so she wrote that in 1832 so there's a huge um, legacy of of women watchers and they bring a particular attitude to bird watching um, and that's that was really um, uh, reassuring and empowering for me. Because as, as a woman, I am much, I, I am not inclined to be a life lister. I'm not inclined to be competitive. When I bird with a group and, and people are going off saying, oh, that bird, that bird, that bird, that bird, that bird, making their list, um, I want to stand and, and, and watch even the most common bird, you know, like a bush tit here in, in Mexico, like, watch how they're engaging with each other. And Louise was a, a, a very dedicated, slow watcher. She watched behavior. Um, she was not interested in, she, she never went on bird trips. She, she, you know, she knew her birds um, and she knew how they were. And in a, in a strange way, they got to know her as well, um, being, you know, all together in this little three acre plot of land. So I think that was probably the most significant um, realization for me. And I've recently met, um, I'm going to be doing a presentation in Vermont for the uh, Green Valley Audubon Society. And the woman who uh, contacted me, Bridget Butler, um, actually has a whole website on slow birding. Um, and it's 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 just fantastic. Um, and it's particularly good for people with with hearing challenges and vision challenges and physical challenges. You know, you don't have to go out there and and, you know, have a life list of, you know, however many thousands of, of birds in the world. Um, you can also enjoy birds in, in many different ways. And so 
and the feminist bird club actually is is um you know kind of focused on that as well so so those things were really significant for me that's amazing and the the feminist bird club we had present to us at the bird study group last year um mm -hmm. and they're starting to expand their um their group into hamilton a little more from toronto um yeah. so a, a great group and from from that group um is a, f a friend of mine who i'm hoping to have present to the bird study group in march uh her name is kelly sue o'connor and and is is very much um pr talking a lot about mindful birding and being yeah. slow and it's and you're right it is such a beautiful way to engage with the outdoors i mean like yeah. you're, you're right and, and and to some folks getting getting the bird for their list and moving on and if that's what they're there to do then great that's fantastic <laughs> no, no judgment um but the but for the rest of us who are slower i think we've <laughs> often felt kind of intimidated by that so it's 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 nice to get that that balance back yeah and what a, and what a way to connect with this earth and i i, I find myself um wanting to spend more time alone outside you know i've got i've got two kids under 10 you mm -hmm. know I've, I've i've got you know a lot of a lot of things happening at work and in volunteerism and and you know sometimes just being alone outside is is exactly what the doctor ordered and my next question to you um to you both has to do with with what's happening in in the in the kind of the medical community uh, i've got several questions here, so i'm just looking for um, okay, so both of you have written about someone, whether it's yourself or or Louise, who um, has directed their attention towards an external force to help cope with their internal anguish. So what can be said about our current healthcare practices when it comes to prescribing outdoor time to heal? What do you think could be done or how could how do you see this being implemented? Do you think? And maybe we'll start with Marilyn with this time. All right. Um, so Louise said, you know, and this, she said this, my goodness, must be 80 years ago. I'm just going to read from the book for a minute. Uh, she said, I know of no occupation so fulfilling as that of becoming a watcher. The observing self is pushed into the background and obliterated except for a cramped leg or an aching muscle imposed by enforced immobility. The present is dominated by the natural stage and all senses are focused upon the amazing events that are constantly taking place. She also said back in the early 40s when everyone was off to war and she was alone in the woods, in one of her letters to Percy Taverner, she said, it's impossible to be bored when you're surrounded by birds. And she said, and I'm paraphrasing here because I'm not going to be able to find the quote, that she was very anxious when this husband was at war. You can imagine she'd already lost one husband to a war. She didn't lose this husband, by the way. But she was very anxious. And she said that watching birds helped her cope with that, with the isolation and the anxiety and the sense that the world was gone mad. And so I, I think she would be very, she would love Bob's book. <laughs> you know, she'd be very much in tune with that. Um, I'm, she also suffered from trigeminal neuralgia. She suffered from all kinds of things, which she didn't talk about very much. But I think that, I'm not sure that this is anything that our medical um, institutions can can really deal with i think it's more a matter of people like bob and myself talking about this and and birders talking about it and sharing it with each other i mean we live in a world where there's tremendous community sharing and i th i think that that you know that sense of you know, forest bathing, which has become a common term now, right? And and how bird watching can take you out of yourself and out of whatever your problems are, psychological, physical, et cetera, and, and really um, improve your life. And I, I'm, I'm not sure you're ever going to get a doctor to say that, 
a medical doctor, because their role is, is to look at symptoms and diagnose and try to figure out how to, how to manage them. I don't think it's going to be part of their repertoire, even though narrative medicine is becoming more common. But I think it's up to us, all of us, you listening, us, us here, you know, um, in, in the spotlight to, to, you know, share this message. Thank you. Bob, what do you think? Yeah, I totally agree with Marilyn. It's, I mean, the only medical part I can think of is the mindfulness. You know, there are all mm -hmm. kinds of mindfulness workshops and whatnot. Yeah. But, you know, I, I think it's more um, like Marilyn's just educating the public because burning, what I like about burning is you can take out of it whatever you want and call it burning. I mean, per, burning can be an art. It can be a science. It can be a sport. It's almost a religious experience for some people. Um, there's so many different ways to bird that can be satisfying to you. You could be handicapped and can't get out, but you could sit at home and have bird feeders. Or maybe you're in an apartment and you don't have bird feeders or backyard, but you can watch a webcam or a nest cam. There's so many different aspects where you can get that mindfulness. And doesn't mean you have to go and hike 10 kilometers or 15 kilometers with a checklist exactly. and binoculars around your neck. It's yeah. whatever you want to take from it and, and enjoy. It's your hobby and it's whatever you like. You know, I, I wrote it down because I, I found it interesting. I found um, a, a note that birders, people that get hooked on birding are in two, can be lumped into two main categories. One is for appreciative motivation. And by that, it's a well-based motivation. Uh, they're burning to appreciate nature, uh, to appreciate the outdoors, uh, the shared experience with friends, um, getting exercise, getting mindfulness. And then the other flip side is the achievement motivation. And that's the listers and e-birders and wanting the most number of birds and, and um, more competitive birding, if you will. Um, but maybe it's also just someone who wants to build their skills, becoming a better photographer. Um, so they're sort of becoming a citizen scientist and contributing and giving back. So there's appreciative and, and there's uh, achievement. So really, that's what I like about it. It's such a spectrum. Uh, if the audience is interested in birding, it's whatever you want to make of it. It's, it's your hobby. You don't have to be the stereotype with the binoculars and the the Tilly hat and, and you know you could be sitting at home watching a webcam you know I do I, not own a I do not own a Tilly hat <laughs> <laughs> just want you to know, make that I, clear <laughs> I highly recommend Cornell Cornell has a feeder cam up in yeah. Manitowash run by a lady named Tammy Hat and she just gets the most spectacular boreal birds and you could sit at home and watch pine grosbeaks and evening grosbeaks and common red poles and today a boreal chickadee and one day, you know, she had a gross up in the feeders, rough gross. That's birding, right? That's just as much birding as me walking around Mary Orchard. So, you know, I, I, I don't like a, a set definition of birding. I'm not really answering your question, Jackson, but it's, you got me thinking. Yeah, no, it's, I, I, I only wanted to put it out there because, um, you know, I, I, I know in, in my work, um, we've been hearing more about doctors prescribing vitamin N, you know, they're prescribing um, patients to get outside more. And I, 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 I can't tell if it's, if it's just a thing that they're doing. Um, and this kind of ties into my next question is, is, you know, how, how accessible is nature um, to folks? You know, when, when we talk about those with special needs or people that are, 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 who can't easily get around, but need to spend time outside, what are we doing right and what are we doing wrong? You know, what are some things and, and do you have any thoughts yeah. about, about how uh, conservation authorities or botanical gardens or the cities can be, can be doing a better job to, to bring more people outside? That's, that's a really, really good question. Um, I think we do, there's, there's huge room for improvement, you know, for instance, there are in most communities, there are conservation areas nearby, there, there are nature paths, you know, pollinator gardens, all of this stuff. But if you look at the paths, if, if you have any vision difficulties, 
um, or if you have any mobility issues, it's going to be very difficult, right? There's tree roots, there's, you know, there's stones, there's rocks, you know, it's, it's difficult. Um, so I think that the paths can be, can be made more accessible. Um, there, so I, I mean, in, in general, I think conservation authorities need to be thinking of this. We also need to, um, engage different communities. I, I'm part of the board of directors of the Pelé Island Bird Observatory. And one of the things that our um, executive director, Suzanne Freeman has, has initiated in the last year or two, I guess now, um, is, is BIPOC birding. So she's making a specific effort to engage, um, you know, communities other than the typical white community uh, and bring them in into birding and uh, the feminist bird club, for instance, it's not just about women. It's about people of color, um, people with um, mobility and vision challenges, etc. I mean, I I can hardly see anymore. I can see shape and color and movement, but you can you can really see. I mean, that comes from. Um, that that still allows me to do incredible birding because I'm a great spotter. I can't identify very much anymore, although I learned birding by um, how birds fly and how they sit. And so I can still identify an awful lot in that way. So if we can if we can open ourselves away from, um, yes, bird guides are great, but there are other ways to be able to identify birds and and see them. And, and this relates back to our own lives, too. I mean, I can't see, I can't identify a person coming towards me on the street. But, you know, nine times out of 10, if I know them according to the color of their hair, the kind of clothes they wear, the way they walk, you know, it's just like identifying a bird. So, so the, you know, there's, I, I think the, the inner relationship between birding and, and your life is, is very close. And I think if we can open ourselves away from bird guides listing the, the able-bodied um, and, and think more broadly, I, I think that will be to the benefit of society as a whole. Amazing. Thank you. Bob. Jackson, were, were you thinking of, of uh, sort of like a formal approach of, of say the RBG approaching the medical association and saying, hey, and, and trying to educate them that rather than prescribing a happy pill, you send them to us and, and we'll take them on a hike? Yeah, that's, you that's one. Some sort of a synergy, like a, an official relationship? I'd, I'd, I'd love, I'd love to pursue that personally. Yes. Um, but I'm also thinking, you know, it would take, it would take, uh, you know, several conversations and some, some walkthroughs in order to achieve that. But I also do want to know, you know, what, what are we doing right and where we can improve things? Um, so Bob, when you were, when you were, at your at your low in, in some of your lows because in, in a lot of your lows like you said you couldn't even get up a lot of hills you had to have someone pushing you from behind um you know do you, wh wh where where in in hamilton especially and maybe others in the chat can can chime in of where some of their favorite spots are that are quite accessible that they find good abundance of birds but also a, a chance to be close to nature without having to move too far if they can't yeah. Before I answer that, I'll just segue back for a second to sure. um, um, approaching the medical community. Just don't ask me to do it because if they read my book and see how much I bash the conventional <laughs> medical community, they might not want me uh, as the representative. No, but I should say that the <laughs> that there are um, people within the medical community who are really interested in this kind of narrative medicine, which goes both ways. They're learning to listen more to patients and and to um, think outside the box. I've been really privileged to have a couple people like that in my life. And, and there are books being written by them about, um, about unconventional ways of dealing with, with illness, particularly chronic illness. So I think the trick is to not approach the Canadian Medical Association or the Ontario Medical Association, but to approach these individuals 
and encourage them so that they will become a voice and in within the conversation. Good idea. In terms of uh, accessible areas, Jackson, I think I mentioned to you, like I, I think LaSalle Marina Park is is fantastic. It's all level, it's all a flat. There's a boardwalk over the, the wet area. Um, Mary Gorchard, I, I know, which I mentioned, I really like. There's a couple of little hills, but for the most part, it's quite flat. Like I, I have to be careful myself because I don't do well on hills. I get really winded really easily. So a lot of the Dundas Valley is, is challenging for me with the escarpment, but Mary Orchard comes to mind immediately and, and uh, the Sal is two great birding spots that are pretty easy. Cool. Um, Darlene in the chat said, thank you for your perspective. There is hope in my experience in 2015, my neurosurgeon as I was in rehab recommended time outside uh, as that is where the next stage of my healing would occur. So, you know, it's, I, I, you're right. It, it, I guess it is up to the individual. Bob, you ran into some folks who um, like they really gave you the cold shoulder and that experience. I'm sure there are others out there who, who experience similar things to you. Um, but th that's kind of the neat part about, about the outdoors, about nature is that there, there could be something that any individual can take away from it. Should they choose to pursue it? Um, which is again why I'm so glad that you've been writing about it. And so I, I guess this would be maybe one of my last questions, only because we're getting close to nine o'clock. Um, and so um, we uh, and I'm, again, I've, I've, I have several questions that I did not ask here tonight. Um, but we, you know, through through the Naturalist Club Journal, like the Wood Duck, um, but through other avenues that folks could pursue writing, whether it's in um, you know, neighborhood journals or through social media, but I, I think I'm from an angle uh, of the youth, of young folks, as writers, um, what, what advice would you give to, 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 to a teenager or someone in high school or in early college or university? What, what words of encouragement could you give to someone who is looking to pursue storytelling um, as a hobby or as a profession? And Bob, we'll start with you this time. I'm still uh, suffering from imposter, imposter syndrome here. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, okay, you're an imposter 20 times over. <laughs> um, all I could say is I wrote from the heart. I mean, I just, you, you know, there's no style. I've had several people say, I, Bob, I can just hear your voice when I'm reading it. It's just like you talking. So, so you know, just break down what you're thinking, write it in your own words and don't worry about fancy, uh, fancy style. I mean, I just, whatever came to me, I just wrote from my heart. I love it. You know, I had, and so I, you I, know, like I said, there was no yeah. intention of being published. It was just for me. And then it happened. Cool. And I think that's, that's really an important place to start is that if you start thinking, if you approach it from the point of view of publishing and of making a fortune, um, forget that. Um, it, it's it's that's pretty unlikely. Um, and you do have to start with um, you know what's inside you and being you know chances are what interests you will interest the world if you're dealing with um, something that is universal. There are uh, lots of courses out there um, for writing. Uh, lots of ways to proceed. I, I mentor beginning writers um, in a very limited way now because of my situation, but uh, there are others like me who do that. I think, uh, honestly, I, I think stories are the most important thing in the world. Uh, it's what, it is what defines us as humans, as, as far as I'm concerned. Um, we learn through stories. We um, that's the most significant way of learning. Um, but to be a writer, there is a great deal of technique to learn as well. Um, in order to convey your ideas and your emotions and your thoughts in a in a in a way that it touches another person, um, it's you know it's very much like music. I mean, you you can sit down, you can play for yourself, um, you can study, you can learn. Um, and you can practice. I mean, I write every single day. There's not a day without writing. Um, there's not a day without reading. The best teachers are other books. 
And um, if you want to write about nature, there are fantastic books out there. Um, you know, there's a lot of books with birds in the title, like, like Goldfinch by Donna Tartt, et cetera, which really have nothing to do with, with nature. But um, I would recommend people like uh, Candace Savage, who wrote Bird Brain, or The Bird Way and the Genius of Birds by Jennifer Ackerman, beautiful writers. Um, uh, Bird Cottage by Eva, Eva Major. Um, a British writer, um, and of course, all that long line of, of writers that I talk about in, in my books, I think you learn a great deal about how you want to express, but also how you don't want to express, right? Often the negative can be as powerful as, as the positive. Uh, there is one question in the chat that I'll, I can just answer really briefly. Uh, uh, Marianne, you sure. asked... Um, whether uh, when Louise noted that 75% decline in the birds in her forest, did that discovery lead to changes? Well, no. <laughs> um, no, it, it did not. But, you know, I find it very interesting that there was a clarion call back in the 1940s. And not only by Louise, uh, amateur birders uh, right across the continent were noticing the same thing. And the good thing is that she sent her data not only, she was very international in her perspective. She sent her data not only to, you know, Ottawa, to the Museum of Natural Sciences and to the ROM. She sent her data to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And so did people like Roy Iver and, and you know, Elsie Castles and, you know, people all across, Margaret Morris Nice, et cetera. And it was from that United States Fish and Wildlife Service data that Rachel Carson drew the, the facts to bolster her argument that chemicals were um, depopulating the songbirds in, in North America. So, um, so it, it did not lead to specific changes in her woods or, and it didn't stop the you know, Ministry of Transportation from spraying the roadsides right in her area. But I think in the larger global scale, it did make us aware of DDT it did stop that particular spraying. It, we still, in our consciousness, we know those chemicals are bad, whether they're coming out, you know, you know, from burning off the fields as they still do here in Mexico, or whether they're, you know, they're coming from chemical pollution in the, in the oceans, et cetera. We know this is destroying our planet. Um, we still are a little slow in doing anything about it, but well, um, it's there, right? You know. Oops, it reminds me of, of something that um, I, I, I hear a lot, um, especially from my, my, my work with youth is the shifting baseline syndrome. And, and so I'm, I've put a link to a, um, to, to a, a neat article and I'm just in the chat and I'm just putting a, a paragraph in there. So without, without knowledge, without facts, from Louise and with and from others um, who who started this 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 journey and and helped um, you know figure out a lot of these facts, we wouldn't have a baseline to begin with. And if we right. if we don't look back on where numbers and where populations and where things occurred in the past, we're not going to have an idea of of where like of of just how bad it, it could be and the work that we'll need to go into ensuring that um we don't shift further away from the baseline because yeah like i wonder what that was like pre-colonization you know like what uh, it's, is yeah. about this? it's so interesting i didn't know this had a this had a, a term and so thank you for that because you know the recent report that came out that says we've lost three billion songbirds you know since 1970 well, that's not taking into account the huge losses since the 19, early 1940s when Louise was counting. And that doesn't take into account the huge losses before Louise since 1832 when, when Harriet Shepherd was counting. So we can't think, oh, you know, it's just three billion birds. A lot, but oh well. No, it's it's billions and billions and billions. The the depopulation in terms of species, not only in birds, but mammals and, and trees and plants and everything else. Um, so that, that 
what did you call it? The shifting baseline syndrome. That is, thank you for that, because I think that is key. We need to remember, read sorrow and see how thick the birds were on the branches then. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 905, and we still have 48 people here tonight, which is great. We had a, an amazing turnout here. I, I did have some friends uh, who read the book. Um, send some questions to me that I was hoping to ask you, um, but perhaps I will I will I will um, allow allow those folks to perhaps reach out to Marilyn specifically if they are about. Please the do, book. yeah, yeah. My website is just marilynsimons.com. You can email me at at simons at marilynsimons.com. You just have to spell it right, which is a bit of a trick. <laughs> um, and there there is some some high praise coming both of your way in the chat from folks. Um, who have read your books um, and who love being here tonight. Gail even said they finished reading Women Watching uh, in the wee hours last night. And uh, so some great timing uh, to be here tonight to catch this. And um, I know you'll both continue to be vocal in, in your respective communities. And Marilyn, when you make your way up to, uh, up to, to Kingston again this spring, uh, if you find your way around Hamilton, Make sure you you let me or someone know. I'd, I I was. I will. Our our daughter lives in Hamilton, so oh, so we are there periodically and and go to RBG and yeah, definitely. Um, I'd love to, I'd love to be able to set up. And Bob and I were kind of ruminating about setting up walks after this that folks could sign up to to take a walk with either of you. So maybe if we can arrange that in the future, that would be something interesting to do too. But oh, that'd be fantastic. I'd love to do that. Awesome. Um, any closing thoughts? Um, from either of you before we end the night tonight. And I'll start with Bob. Any last messages that you want to relay to the folks um, who are here tonight or who might catch this after the fact? I, I think that the takeaway is, you know, I don't, I hope I wasn't fear mongering and scaring people that don't let you, I know people that are really, really paranoid about, about encountering a, a tech and, and uh, don't let it ruin your, your your fun of the outdoors. It's far outweighs the, the risk of uh, of the Lyme. And uh, and uh, you know you can be cured. You just have to take sensible precautions. And and you know birding turned my life around. It absolutely was my salvation. And you know I I joke. I wish I'd been birding like I am now. You know when I look at the map of where I traveled all over the world and inaccessible places in the highlands of New Guinea and around Greenland, the birds that I saw and ignored. But the flip side of that is I would have been fired. <laughs> you would have got, <laughs> you got no work done. I would, it wouldn't have lasted two days because I wouldn't have gotten any work done to be looking at the birds instead of the rocks. So, so just, it's never too late to get into it, but young people get into birding now because just think how good you'll be at it by the time you're my age. Well, um, that's that's the joy of being a writer that, you, you know, nobody's ever going to fire you. <laughs> so, so you can dawdle as much as you want. <laughs> I um, would just say, get out there, you know, just get out there. Um, sometimes, you know, sometimes the pressures of work and kids and responsibilities and obligations, you, you can find all kinds of excuses not to take that, you know, a couple of hours a week. We, my husband and I, we, we go up to the, Charco, which is the local um, nature area, uh, every Sunday. And, you know, it's a hike up there. And we often think, oh, dear, do we really want to do this? And we are always so happy we did. So I would just say, you know, put put your reservations aside and just, you know, maybe make a an intention for, for this year to, you know, at least once a week, get out there for a couple of hours and notice the birds. And what a what a great way to start the new year is with is with setting good intentions like that, Marilyn. Thank you so much, um, uh, Bob. Before you go, so Sheldon in the chat said, "Thank you both. Uh, see you for your book signing on Saturday, Bob." Um, is that something you can share with with folks here tonight, or is there? I forget what's going on with you Saturday. Yeah, sure. No, my my good friend Barb Canny has has arranged uh, that to uh, have a little book signing actually at the parking lot of LaSalle Marina in Burlington. Um, Barb, I don't know if you're on here. I think it starts at nine thirty um, on Saturday morning, and 
an hour, an hour and a half or so. So if anybody wants a, a book signed or go for a stroll, see some birds. That, okay, that's great. Just coming, that's just coming. Wish I could be there. <laughs> um, <laughs> the weather looks good too. Uh, maybe not actually. <laughs> Yeah, um, Bob, someone in the <laughs> was, was just to the panelists said that they bought a, a copy of your book for their dad. So they're wondering where the signing was. So that's at the LaSalle, that's at the clubhouse up top? No, right right down on the water, in the okay. parking lot at the water. Well, you won't be able to miss them down there. Um, but what great company for a dark January night, says Gail. And I couldn't agree more. So again, I haven't ventured into having authors um, as part of the bird study group, but what 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 a great way to 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 break out of the mold of bringing in students and organizations and to have have great minds coming in here tonight um, and sharing the stories and passing on the passions and the stories and the work from generations before and hopefully um, trying to inspire the generations still to come. So on behalf of the Bird Study Group, the Hamilton Naturalist Club, Marilyn Bob, thank you so much for coming tonight. Thank you. Us. Yeah, the, it's much. it's been a real pleasure. They, and thank you, Bob. It's been great to get to know you. Nice to meet you, Marilyn. Yeah. All right, nice. everyone. In, enjoy the rest of your night. Good luck in the freezing rain tomorrow. Marilyn, not so much for you. Uh, <laughs> and we'll see you next month to learn about crossbills. Good night, everyone. Good night.